Well, you've heard about them, right? The non-elected technocrats who are running the world. Men who sit in back rooms away from the limelight, determining how we live, taking control of the planet bit by bit, subverting the course of democracy for some ulterior motive that is never really explained by the conspiracy theorists. Why are they doing this? Uh, There's one area where democracy is shunted aside for non-elected decision makers. That's in the work of central banks. Is that what the conspiracy theorists are worried about? In which case, maybe I'll join them. Today, who are the secret men, and nobody has ever suggested they are women, who are the secret men running the world on the Debunking Economics podcast with Steve Keen? I'm Phil Dobby, and shh, you never know who's listening. Now, Steve, I made a mind suggested this one uh, because someone he knows is one of these big conspiracy theorists. There's a dangerously increasing number of these people around. Uh, but this is one that, you know, is believing that governments around the world are trying to move us off cash so they can see what we're doing and use that to control our behavior. Now, of course, central banks do try and control our behavior. Of course, that's why they're pushing up interest rates now. But he's talking about the whole China style behavior control where the state keeps an eye on what you're spending and perhaps rates you as an individual accordingly, which uh, actually sounds a bit like the insurance industry to me. That's what they do. Uh, But this all stems from Klaus Schwab uh, at the World Economic Forum, the guy who started the World Economic Forum two years ago, who said that the, uh, the time is now right for the Great Reset Uh, which some people are very fearful of uh, because they see that this means unelected representatives gaining control, like central banks, and uh, challenging our civil liberties. So, uh, yeah, should unelected representatives, Steve, be able to see what we're doing with our money? I think that's perhaps a good start point. (laughs) Should they? Look, I've I've got to start from one point here, which I've been hearing people saying this stuff, including friends of mine. I've got two, I won't name names, obviously, but two friends I know, quite intelligent people, they're starting to come up with all this conspiracy stuff thing. You know, Dan Dan Andrews having gone to a World Economic Forum thing and uh, Jacinda Ahern having gone to one, and therefore that explains why they they did their policies about uh, lockdowns, which were completely different to everybody else went to the same two bloody forums ended up being a government leader somewhere but anyway i said the people who you think are trying to run the world couldn't plan lunch <laughs> okay well i know some of these people okay i'm not sure but the one the one that i think of uh, all the time is one of the i think he's still one of the three people in charge of the european central banker peter pratt mm. and i call him i call him peter pratt I've, I've rarely met anybody who's as deluded as him. Um, that's the, 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 there, are, you know, there are plenty, but he's so obviously deluded. And he, he, he believes the neoclassical textbook, and that's what he's sprouting when he's saying what the ECB's actions are going to be. I remember going to a seminar once, which was a business seminar in Germany, and he was the first speaker, I was the second. And he said it's important for the public to have confidence in what the central bank is doing. And I could, you could feel the audience, who were all people from the financial sector, every, whatever ounces of confidence they had in the central bank were just going down as long as Peter Pratt continued speaking. Um, so the idea that people like him in positions of authority I, I, I planning something and know what they're doing. Um, the, 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 the two, those two hypotheses simply aren't on the same planet. Yes, they're planning something. Do they know what they're doing? They haven't got a damn clue. They're using the wrong, the wrong uh, toolbox to talk about it. Uh, and and they're and what they're doing. It looks like a plan. Is is normally if there's any element of planning to it, it's making up for the the stuff up for the previous plan they did that's just finished. <laughs> All right. Okay. But but what is it that they are planning? So so Klaus Schrab. Uh, said the pandemic represented a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine and reset our world to create a healthier, more equitable and more prosperous future. And I think he was basically saying, you know, this will rely on more digital technology. So we used contact tracing apps, for example, you know, which might might have been fine during Mm -hmm. a pandemic. But do we want governments actually to be able to see where we are? And, and what we might be doing, which is why you start to get into this. Well, it's useful for that, but we really don't want this to go too far because we will end up like like China. Uh, well, if, you, if, you, if, if you backtrack and see where the ideas of, 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 of abolishing cash came from, hmm. they, they came out of the, again, neoclassical economics because – the uh, the idea that uh, that central banks had because they're all staffed by you know, all all the, all the there's a handful of non neoclassical thinkers in central banks these days but the vast majority of them are true believers in neoclassical theory now as part of neoclassical theory you believe that if the if a bank has extra reserves it can lend those reserves out 
Yeah. Okay? And, and, and they also believe, and this is, this is where it comes, this is the, the key thing for um, this particular policy, they believe that people's daily consumption is affected by the interest rate because, you know, you, you know what you're doing when you go shopping. You're planning for the infinite future. You know, you're sitting down there and saying, what's going to happen to my great, 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 great grandson and daughter uh, as I go and buy this bottle of milk? Okay, and therefore, if you increase the interest rate, uh, that's going to make the, uh, uh, the de- devalue the future. Um, so you've got to go buy buy more milk now. <laughs> And then if, if the government runs a deficit, that means got to, you know it's got to be taxed in the future. So you're going to spend less when the government runs a deficit. All this stuff is built into a whole range of simply... Is it really that complicated? Theory. I thought I thought you just the interest rates go up, you've got less money because you're paying a higher mortgage, so therefore you've got less money no, to they, buy stuff. Am I simply, they, they, oversimplifying they, things? Yeah, they, 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 they literally have an arse about tit vision of how the world operates. So they yeah. think if you, if you create money now, people will spend less. And if you don't create money now, people will spend more. Because uh, and this, this came out of what's called the... Uh, uh, oh, this is a guy's name. It's called Ricardian equivalence. Yeah, this is one of one of the many hot topics inside the brains of neoclassical economists. And this one came out because of the the guy who dreamt up this piece of bullshit, named Robert, Robert Barrow, who's an arch conservative neo- neoclassical economist. Um, I, I believe part of the motivation was that he f- he found himself uh, being charged too much what he thought was too much money to get a toilet fixed in a in a, a, a house he owned in Italy, and he decided to screw the Italian working class. That's that's one of the little lines I've heard. Don't 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 quote me on that one. But no, yeah, I think you just quoted yourself, Steve. I, I quoted myself, but that's the. <laughs> <laughs> well, on a anyway. podcast, you do know people listen to this, don't you? Oh but damn, what a, what a pain. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it, see, his, he was put this idea to say that the government a government deficit actually reduced private spending, and the idea was that you, everybody knows the government has to pay its debt back, and that again is another case of neoclassical bullshit. Mm. But if you're assuming everybody knows what what is what is bullshit about the world economy, which neoclassical economists believe. Then if the government runs a deficit, everybody knows there's going to have to be extra taxes in future. So what that means is you will now save money uh, to give as a, as a bequest to your great, 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 great grandchild so that they can pay the higher rate of tax in the future. Now, the reason I'm saying great, 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 great is that uh, one of the objections that neo- neoclassical economists put forward to this idea that people will, uh, if, if the government runs a deficit, um, note that there's got to be future taxes and therefore they'll save money to pay the future taxes. The argument was, well, what if this happens outside your lifetime? You're not going to, you know, if, if you, you're only going to be putting that money aside if you think you've got to pay it. And Barrow, and this is virtually a quote, Barrow said, this argument fails uh, if people um, uh, plan with an infinite future. If people are p- putting aside um, money to pay future taxes out of What's the word that economists can't can't say? Generosity, altruism. That's right. He actually used altruism, altruistic behaviour by individuals, as a reason to demolish an argument against his hypothesis. Now, neoclassical economists regard altruism as brain disease. Fundamentally, you've got to be doing it for your own self-interest. But here, to to, to hang on to an argument to say that yes, it doesn't matter when the taxes are going to be levied in the future, you will make a bequest in the future, and therefore government spending now will cause you to spend less. Right. So getting back on track, how does this relate to the idea? I mean, the, the, I think there's two different arguments in this. Yeah. Uh, in, in these conspiracy theories, w- one is that you know is the whole. T- uh, technocracy thing if that's the way you pronounce yeah. it but about just you know we're going to use technology a great deal more uh, in, in the future and, and that's going to be used for surveillance purposes and the other side is you know which is like the, the, like the China approach about, about controlling behaviour so, yeah. so if you, if you play too many video games or you drive mm. badly that's going to add to your social ranking score and the penalties are well I've heard you know that theoretically your internet could slow down or you, you have a stop on travelling and that does seem to be applying but from what I also read is actually it's not happening a great deal in China this attempt as you you're saying at the beginning this attempt to try and get all this data together uh, even if that was the plan it's not it's not really working that well, well but the, yeah but we, 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 I wanted to backtrack to the interest rate argument because yeah. they believe that if, if they if they, if they actually want people to spend money then they think well we should lower interest rates yeah okay okay but the thing said well but the possibility is that people can take uh, we, we want people to spend more. We want to encourage more consumption. That was the major factor back around in the post in the post uh, financial crisis. Well, they say, how do we stimulate consumption? And the argument was, well, 
they, they were against saying you could run a, run a deficit. They thought that wouldn't stimulate spending when it does stimulate spending. But they also thought that interest rates going down would encourage people to spend more now. And then they found people weren't because they couldn't have money in cash. And they thought, well, if everybody only has money in deposit accounts, then this our theory has to work because cash was something they couldn't affect. The, the, uh, they couldn't the, control. They yeah, could, couldn't control. Mm. So the, the idea was, well, let's abolish cash and then you know we can um, – we can whatever we do to try to affect consumption in our mathematical models of the real world, which are a total fiction. Um, that will then flow through to the real world. And like at the time, I said, look, the, I was against the abolition of cash because the last thing I wanted was people who don't understand money in control um, of it. The control of money, abolishing you know, part of the money that at least is free from their machinations. Now there is a lot more to this discussion, but they don't want you to hear it. But if you do want to hear it, you can beat the system by becoming a subscriber at debunkingeconomics.com or you can become a supporter of Steve Keen on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash prof Steve Keen. You can hear the full version of this interview and all the other ones where we talk about all sorts of stuff. Uh, so hopefully you'll do that. We'll see you back here and you can hear the other half of the discussion about those men who are trying to rule the world and we don't know who they are. Uh, Till next week, I'm Phil Dobby with Steve Keen. Have a good week. See you next week. 